This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Israeli Prime Minister Bennett makes an historic trip to the UAE as the war of words heats up between Israel and Iran. We're going to be discussing ways to further our cooperation in a number of fields, especially strengthening our economic and commercial ties. And in Bethlehem, the Church of the Nativity undergoes a major restoration where, despite COVID, spiritual life continues. Plus, a Christian ministry rebuilds a church for persecuted Christians in Syria. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. For the first time in its history, an Israeli prime minister paid an official visit to the United Arab Emirates, highlighting changes in the Middle East since the Abraham Accords. Less than two years ago, it would have been unthinkable for most for Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed to greet Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett in Abu Dhabi. Before he left for the UAE, Bennett explained the purpose of his visit. We're going to be discussing ways to further our cooperation in a number of fields, especially strengthening our economic and commercial ties. In just one year since normalizing our relationship, we've already seen the extraordinary potential of the Israel-UAE partnership. And this is just the beginning. The importance of the meeting is, is the meeting itself. The fact that they can uh, have a photo op, shake hands, talk about the peace, and for the whole world and the region to see that. Bennett's visit follows a blitz of Israeli diplomacy in light of the nuclear talks in Vienna to stop Iran's nuclear program. Last month, for the first time, Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz paid an official visit to one of the Arab nations in the Abraham Accords and signed a military memorandum of understanding with Morocco. Last week, Gantz met with U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin about the Iranian threat. The nuclear program is a means to Iran's hegemonic goals, imposing its radical ideology and threatening Israel's existence. I'm deeply concerned about the Iranian government's nuclear actions in recent months, both its continued provocations and its lack of constructive diplomatic engagement. The president has made clear that if diplomacy fails, we are prepared to turn to other options. What those options are remains to be seen, but Israel has made clear its military option is on the table to stop Iran's nuclear program. Bennett's visit to the United Arab Emirates underscores how far the Abraham Accords have progressed and how both Israel and its Sunni Arab neighbors see Iran as their mutual existential enemy. Meanwhile, the war of words between Israel and Iran is intensifying. The rhetoric comes at a time when the nuclear talks in Vienna to stop Iran's nuclear program seem stalled. When Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz met with U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin recently, he reportedly presented a timeline for an Israeli attack on Iran's nuclear program and told Lloyd Israel is preparing for the Iranian challenge at the operational level. Following that exchange, the state-affiliated Tehran Times boasted in an article called Just One Wrong Move that Iran can hit Israel anywhere. To drive home that point, they included a map showing targets Iran had already selected throughout Israel. The question for many is, how do Israel and Iran view the U.S. role in this confrontation? I think the picture is clear that the Iranians see uh, that the United States is, they don't have to fear the United States, and they're continuing to escalate their program, and in return for the escalation, all they get is more and more concessions to the administration. Michael Makovsky, CEO of Jinza, a security think tank, has recently talked with a number of Israeli military leaders. They feel they're alone. They know they're alone. They see a U.S. that is withdrawing from the region, retreating, afraid of confrontation, desperate for a deal, not able to instill fear in the Iranians. And uh, they feel the responsibility is going to be on them, the Israeli military, to prevent a nuclear Iran. Mikofsky says these Israeli military leaders see U.S. weakness and cite the recent Afghan pullout, U.S. reluctance to retaliate against Iran's provocations in the Middle East, and eagerness to enter into a flawed deal in Vienna. In the meantime, they're looking to the U.S. for the tools to strike Iran, like KC-46 air tank refuelers.
That's not the only thing Israel needs, by the way. They also need precision guided munitions. They need more F-35s, F-15Is, some helicopters, things like that. I would not only accelerate delivery to Israel of this, I would make a show of it. It would be a signal to the Iranians. Israelis seem prepared for what might be coming. According to a recent poll, over half of Israelis would favor a military strike against Iran, even without U.S. help. If I was the prime minister, I wouldn't wait for the United States. I would take some definitive action now. I don't know if I would bomb right away, but I think as, a, as an option B, I think that's probably what I would do. If somebody walks up to you and says, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to kill your whole family, would you wait for that to happen or would you take some definitive action to prevent it? Due to the situation in Iran, they can't have a nuclear weapon. Now, we don't care that India have nuclear weapons or Afghanistan, but Iran is a different thing. It's ideology of destroying the Jewish country. And the last time somebody had this ideology, he killed almost all of the Jewish people. But I don't think the IDF leadership harbors any illusions that the United States will take care of this problem. I do believe when it comes down to it, they're going to have no choice. I think the U.S. policy has been only to bring us closer to war. I believe the chances are more likely than not that the Israelis will do something militarily to prevent a nuclear run. I just think they know they cannot live with a nuclear run. The question is, is, what is their red line? Whatever that red line might be, it appears to be getting closer. Coming up, one of the first churches in the world undergoes major renovations. Also, we have to be renovated ourselves. We have to be renewed spiritually. As we approach Christmas, one of the world's first churches is undergoing major renovations. It's in Bethlehem, and as CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl tells us, despite COVID limiting visitors, the church's spiritual life remains strong. Commissioned by the Roman Emperor Constantine at the request of his mother Helena, the Church of the Nativity is built over the place where many believe Jesus was born. Whenever anybody comes from all over the world, they have to, to taste and to, to, to feel that the place where actually Jesus was born here as to give the people the peace and love. The Church of the Nativity was originally built about 1,700 years ago. Since then, it's been destroyed and rebuilt a number of times. The most recent renovation began in 2013. The fourth century church was built there. It was octagonal in shape, and when it was rebuilt, because it did not have earth-moving equipment, they built on top of it. So you have like a little over two feet of uh, change in elevation. Right. Fast forward about 700 years to the Crusader rule. This colonnade was built by the Crusaders, the largest here. This used to be a marketplace, but the Crusaders included in the church and they built these 50 columns. Mazen Karam is CEO of the Bethlehem Development Foundation. Its goal is to renew Bethlehem by providing a sustainable life for residents while making the city attractive for visitors. They started by upgrading Manger Square, then moving on to the Church of the Nativity. There, they fixed a very leaky roof and the windows. The original is not here anymore. Mm -hmm. They replaced them with new windows. The wall mosaics added to the church more than 850 years ago, as well as the original floor mosaics, desperately needed repair. 11% of the mosaic exists. The rest was lost. So they cleaned up all the mosaic. It was very dirty and, very, you know, soot and debris, and they cleaned it. In the process came a surprise. They discovered the third angel. The third angel was completely covered with plastics. They also created a Dopta column to refurbish the church's 50 columns at a cost of around $50,000 each. Others, like art conservator Andreas Miaulis from the Italian company Artis, are working to restore the area by the altar. 
We try to bring everything back to the beginning before it damage over the time. This part of the church is around 250 years old. This is a very good example because you can see the before and after uh, result. As you can see, all these really dark areas are a result of uh, years and years of residual of soot from candles as well as uh, human uh, fat because the majority of the people, they touch everything, so they leave a lot of little little oils. We clean it, we restore it, and then where it's missing uh, gold leaves, we try to put it back on again and resurrect it in a way that it once was. Karam says renovations are conducted project by project based on available funds. The Catholic, Greek Orthodox, and Armenian denominations share guardianship over the church. Since a long time, we didn't have uh, any restorations, so that's the best thing that is doing now. They're great because church needs to renovate it, and not only physically, also we have to be renovated ourselves. We have to be renewed spiritually and be educated about Lord's commandments. Father Isa Talgie and Very Reverend Father Asped Balian say two years of COVID keeping away international visitors has been rough, although they have hope for the future. Even if there are no tourists, no people, still we have prayers, we have uh, services going on. Day by day, the church is open. The local people come to visit, to pray. Actually, uh, COVID-19 teaches us how to be patient, to have more faith of God, to trust God, that He's standing by us day by day. I pray that may God really remove all these difficulties. The life will come back normally and regularly and we'll restart also a communal prayer together, praising the Lord and thanking Him for all the gifts He has given us and sharing His gifts together. Julie Stahl, CBN News, The Church of the Nativity, Bethlehem. Up next, persecuted Christians in Raqqa get a new church to replace the one destroyed by ISIS. Something uh, a miracle for us to see, to see uh, us together again. When ISIS seized Raqqa in 2014, Christians and other minorities who had lived in the Syrian city for generations paid a heavy price. Many were killed and thousands fled. Now that ISIS has been defeated there, people are picking up the pieces and doing their best to resume normal life. Here's CBN Chuck Holton. Before Syria's 10-year civil war, thousands of Armenian and Syriac Christians lived here in Raqqa, and many attended the city's two main Christian churches. Then ISIS seized Raqqa and made the city its capital, forcing most believers to flee. Those who stayed faced brutality in the form of beheadings, crucifixions, and sexual slavery. Syrian Democratic Forces, backed by the United States, eventually defeated ISIS in 2017, opening the city to humanitarian relief. When the Free Burma Rangers first made it to Raqqa, the city lay in ruins. The former Armenian Church of the Forty Martyrs was just a shell of a building. It is 4 February 2018 in Raqqa, and this is the remains of one of the churches in Raqqa, and our prayer is that it will rise again. Thanks for praying. God answered those prayers, and now a new building stands in place. American pastor Tay Pei helped get it done. I am friends with David Eubanks, and he, he, was, he told me that he was going to Iraq and Syria, and I asked him if he had any needs. And one was particularly rebuilding the church in Syria, and that captured my heart, and I wanted to be part of that. Tay's church raised $60,000 to help rebuild the church. This year, Tay got to come to Syria to see it be rededicated. Before ISIS took over Raqqa in 2014, there were about 150 families that used to attend this church. But now, there are really only about 12 believers left in Raqqa. But the church has been rebuilt. And with the help of the Free Burma Rangers and many people who donated money, Today is a very special day as we go to rededicate this church to God and hope that he will send more believers to fill the pew. The Lord be gracious 
unto you. The Lord will turn his face towards you and give you overflowing peace, joy, and love. After many years, we can finally return to being Armenians. I feel like I am a new Christian all over again. Praise God. We now have a place to come and worship and make the sign of the cross. This is the square where ISIS tank came down. You've seen it on TV where they came down and did donuts in the tanks. This is it. This is the center of town right here. And this this little sculpture right over my shoulder here. They used to put heads on that thing. Not that, not that long ago either. So people here are very happy that ISIS is gone. Still, threats remain from terrorist cells operating in the city. This same night, a car bomb went off just a few blocks away from the church. Even so, residents here remain optimistic. We are a few in Raqqa, but it's something, uh, a miracle for us to see to see uh, us together again. We, we, we are 12 people, yes, but we, we are too much. We, we are power, we are strength, we have each other, and we will start again. For their part, the Free Burma Rangers are continuing to help the people of northern Syria, bringing the love of Jesus in the form of food distributions and games for the kids. All the village are glad for your come because you made their uh, children happy and you support them uh, spiritually. The Rangers give God all the glory for what he's doing here. That's how it was. This is how it is now. Thank you all you brothers and sisters in Jesus in America that prayed this would happen and people all over the world who prayed. Thank you. Look what happened. Look what God did. From Northern Syria, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Still ahead, a stunning archaeological discovery reveals more about life in Jerusalem from 2,000 years ago. It didn't look like a coin, so I was thinking to myself, this is some kind of stone, and actually I told to the girls, put it in the garbage can. An 11-year-old girl has made one of this year's most significant archaeological finds in Israel. The discovery reveals more of what life was like in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. In the Emek Zurim Park, visitors can sift through debris from the ongoing excavation in the City of David. That's where Liel Kudakop found a rare silver coin from the time of the Second Temple. It feels something not normal. And I um, go to their archaeologic was there, and he cleaned it a little bit, and then he told me, and for my family, that's a silver coin. At first, Liel's father thought they should throw it away. Actually, it didn't look like a coin, so I was thinking to myself, this is some kind of stone, and actually I told to the girls, put it in the garbage can. But they insisted that this is a coin, and they took the coin to the archaeologist that was on the site, and he confirmed that uh, this is indeed a coin. I was very excited, and it's like some happy feel, because somebody touched it before 2,000 years, and right now I'm touched. This is a very rare find. Together with this silver coin, we know from the archaeological documentation only 30 other silver coins from the rebellion. The coin has two Hebrew inscriptions. We can see here the words in ancient Hebrew, Shekel Israel, and a second line with two Hebrew letters, Shin Bet, which means the second year of the rebellion against the Romans. 67 8 AD. On the other side of the coin, we have another inscription in ancient Hebrew which says, Le Yerushalayim Akdusha, to Holy Jerusalem. Archaeologists believe the high priest in the temple wanted the coin to help pay for the revolt against the Romans. Coins were minted in order to emphasize independence of certain communities. So the Jews that rebelled against the Romans wanted to emphasize that they are independent. 
The Hebrew wording on the coin harkens back to the first temple for a reason. To the time of King David and his son King Solomon. The Jews wanted to emphasize their connection to the great kingdom of Israel led by King David. They missed it. They wanted their kingdom to be as large as King David's kingdom. The coin came from a layer of debris dating to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. I'm standing on the remains of uh, the ancient pilgrimage road that led Jews from all over the world to the temple itself. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the street itself, all the structures that stood on both sides of this street collapsed into one pile. To Levy, the discovery is like traveling back in time. To hold this silver coin is like going back 2,000 years ago and actually touching the common, the daily life of the people that lived in Jerusalem. Liel's mother sees it as more proof of Jewish life in Jerusalem. It tells a lot about the history, about the people that lived here, about everything, uh, about the history of this place, of Jerusalem, and the meaning of this place to us, to, to the Israelis, to the Jewish people. So yes, it means a lot. Well, that's another discovery showing the Jewish connection to the land of Israel going back thousands of years. That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blasts so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.